Okay, I'll start by saying thank you very much. Uh, when I came in, there were empty chairs, and um, I feel that always that when there is uh, some intimate work, a work of a different kind, um, I wait audience, I await audience to come. And sometimes it's a very small intimate group which feels wonderful in one way because the work then takes on a very personal kind of conversation. Um, it's good to see all of you, many of you friends, artists, and uh, um, who are familiar with Manisha's work. I have been familiar with Manisha's work for a long time. I have not written enough on her work. I have not written uh, many times, mm. but, um, but I'm familiar with the work, with the practice. And I think there is something to be said about the practice that does not easily um, fall under any one kind of uh, category or, any, or cannot be categorized so easily. Um, we may call it for our own comfort that this is abstract or this is abstraction, which may not be the case because I think even if it does not arise from a sense of visual knowledge, it arises from a sense of effect knowledge in the world. You know, the world of effect knowledge, the world of associations, the world that you feel around, the pulse that you feel around. And so I always remember, and since we both have studied at Baroda and there is a common, um, a common convergence point in a stream, I will say that she would speak very little, but she always talked about how her, idea, her art comes from something that she has concretely experienced. Mm. Okay. Her art. Her art. So it is not something that is created in a vacuum. Mm. Obviously, there is a role for, there is a place for observations. There is a place for intuitions. There is a place in between, which we don't know how to describe. Mm. But there is some place for that feeling, that effect that I'm, I'm talking about. And it really enriches uh, the conversation thereon because it's not so simple, not so straightforward, but extremely honest and sincere in the way that it was put, put to us when we were uh, studying their uh, drawing in, in foundation course. Mm. So I'm, I'm going to start by this, uh, by saying that amidst all that was happening there in Baroda, which you know and which others know by now, which have, we have so much emphasis on storytelling, narration, you know, the figural narrative kind of a paradigm. I don't know how you steered yourself away and went into some other direction? Or how did that happen? How did that turning away happen? Because it was not so easy or simple. I know my own colleagues, of course I then went into art history, but my own colleagues who were doing painting or who had enrolled for sculpture were very much into, um, into that training which was to do with looking at the world, which is of course a world full of people, objects, stories, streets, uh, you know, scenarios, environments. So I just want to start there because it, 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 it's interesting that where you are now and this journey is, uh, is also a journey of process, okay, how you have been processing your thoughts, your reflections on the world. So let's start there. Maybe you can give us a lead into how this happened or was there any trigger apart from what was <coughs> being taught there? as uh, or, or seen around. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rubina, for agreeing to do this conversation. I've been actually mm. waiting to have a more deeper conversation mm. with you in a long time because mm. I really appreciate the fact that you have <coughs> done major survey shows on Nasreen, Jairam Patel, Himmat Shah, mm. the artists I have associated mm. myself with and have spent time with. and. Uh, so it was great to see a huge body of work which you put together, uh, which KNMA had put together. And it's almost like getting back into education when you look at this, uh, these big, large survey shows and find yourself, uh, figure it out what one's own journey has been mm -hmm. and uh, how these uh, people have impacted you. So I did join. Uh, Baroda uh, <clears throat> and the first year was with Nasreen and I want to also said, say that I 
did spend some time with Chhatpar sir. Mm -hmm. And I think those two people impacted me in a strange way, which I don't think I was ready to understand at that point. I think when you are 16, 17 years old, complex ideas don't get to you. You just follow it because someone has told you to do so. So it's only after being deeply involved in the practice that those ideas come back to you and they start to make sense. So I seriously thought I didn't have any imagination when I was in Baroda because we had fantastic draftsmen in our class who would make wonderful work and, and I thought I need an object in front of me and I would only be comfortable doing still life. So it would be personal object, and still life also had to be personal objects, like my shoes, my bag, and that got extended to my portrait. So the reference was always needed. I don't think I, I thought I didn't have an imagination in my mind to uh, create a situation or a story. So I think there was a reliance on looking at something and imbibing. And that went on for a year, a year's. Till perhaps I came to, there were two subjects, object drawing and then it was composition. That composition, whenever it came, it became a difficult thing for me because I was like, I don't know what am I going to draw. But since you are in an institute which is talking about narrative painting and in art history one is studying, Sheikh Bhai took a wonderful uh, subject called Story of Painting, which would go into pre-Renaissance works and uh, miniature painting. So I think his way of teaching was such that one got imbibed into it. In my, by masters, I think I managed to make figurative works and uh, they're there. I mean, my early works have those uh, images because you are part of an institute and you do what has been told, uh, you give yourself that chance. But the change happened when I went to London to study and the figures took a walk out of my work. It's because I think the visual reference which we saw in figurative postures when we did sketching in the, at, the, at the railway station and all, all that was gone. So what got replaced by were objects objects of cultural difference, so objects like bathtub, shoes, hats, and somehow the work became more emblematic. Mm -hmm. Objects which is become an, becoming an emblem to the cultural change I was uh, facing and experiencing. And that emptying out mm -hmm. actually gave me certain kind of direction which is a beginning of what I have arrived at now. So there was an emptying out of space, colors got removed, it was more monochromatic, I could only deal with that, couldn't deal with colors as, a, uh, as an additional thing. So I think that those two years have been an important part in, in the graph of uh, wherever I am right now. <clears throat> Let me just um, I take a moment here because it's very interesting, today I was, in a, I was having a meeting with Raghu Rai and uh, we were talking because his archive is huge. I was just talking to him about portraits, you know, and mm. he said that is the least favorite of my shoulder. And I said, why? And he said that because the, the, the person who's made to sit becomes an object. Mm. And it becomes an object and it's almost like it becomes um, something artificial because if you see the portraits, they, they suddenly their eyes become strained, they become very conscious, the sitter becomes very conscious how they are sitting, things like that. And it takes away from, I think in one sense what I, he meant was, it takes away from the natural pulse of the phenomena. You know, there is a moment and here is a moment which is created or something like that. I, have some, I tend to ask some painters who have, you know, who really did some figuration, whether they moved away from figuration as a compulsion, not as an inner compulsion, or something that the skill was not enjoyable to capture uh, figures, or was it that because they were not needed, they, they, they are eliminated because there is no need for them or there is not a story to be told, and therefore the, the, the objects that you said, like the bathtub or some, still speak of something like a metaphor or, or emblematic of that moment. What is it in your case? Was, your, was it 
was it uh, you felt deficient in skill or you felt that no this is not my my kind of my my passion or interest doesn't lie in having uh, uh, them in my painting or have them around or I seriously it? thought Rubina I didn't have much to say mm -hmm. I people had lots of stories to tell but I didn't have much to say I've I, I come from a pri privileged background mm. I don't have uh, I didn't have a gender story I didn't have uh, mm. I have a another political story to mm. say I but I enjoyed making work and I wanted that mm. space to be mine mm. and uh, so how do you navigate that was an issue mm. and uh, I have a painting I was looking at when I was in my fourth year. It's me stretching a canvas with studio setup. And the title of the painting is, I don't know what to paint. Mm. So I think there was an issue. Um, mm. And others had stories to tell. I don't think I had a story <laughs> to tell. <laughs> so, but I liked making work. So how mm. do I mm. do that? And, mm. And I think I enjoyed uh, capturing light. I enjoyed uh, still life, just capturing and mm. watching and doing, mm. Im imitating what was there. Mm. So I think that was a bit of a question. And, mm. uh, and I think going away was a good space of time where mm. <clears throat> I was just thrown into the dark to mm. figure out your journey back. And I think two years away gave that chance to, uh, to explore other possibilities mm. and uh, explore other artists, other methods of making work. Mm. And also to have that basic faith that perhaps there are other ways of, mm. of, of uh, telling my story in that sense. And I think when I started making works in uh, series, it was almost like I had an idea and I would make versions of it mm. till I exhausted myself and I made sort of 100 version of it or 50 version of it. So the story was the process of that serializing the idea. Mm. Mm. So if at all the narrative became that, mm. the narrative was not in the subject which I was. Mm. So it became about process. Mm. And I wanted to sort of grab it by both hands because I enjoyed making work and mm. I felt I want to sort of uh, own it. Mm. And so I think materials started to excite. Um, uh, when I'm down in dumps, I look at what do I have to paint with? And, mm. I, and, and I think something of it comes from my father also because he's a material hoarder. Mm. And so the studio would be full of things even if I go to his mm. studio. So a little something would give a trigger to say, okay, this is what I can experience in the, in the paper. So, so I think that became mm. a journey for me. Mm. And uh, just responding to the, uh, yeah. the paper, the uh, mm. pigment, the, uh, uh, the surface. And uh, <clears throat> is it, it's, in, it's interesting because a lot of artists really were questioning the assumption that a painting must be a picture of something. It ne doesn't necessarily need. It doesn't necessarily need to be that. Mm. Okay, so it can actually be liberated from that. Mm. Okay, and uh, so you find your own journey, as you said. The process takes over. Your what you're seeing, what you're observing, what you're feeling, whatever is there, it starts appearing, you know, in one form or the other, mm. without even saying that this is literal or this is metaphoric or this is uh, uh, this is abstract. You know, mm. forms start emerging, and now how to process those, how to really build on those, mm. you know, because a lot of your work, as I see through, the, through time, through journey, is so much about construction of that, mm. you know, the process, as you say it, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it could be direct, it could be indirect, it could be something that you want to, work, you want to create textures or you arrive at them. Mm. There is this kind of an, intuitively evolving of a work in a very organic way you know it just goes on it's not so premeditated it's not perhaps pre-drawn it's mm. not really pre-thought completely okay but there are there are gatherings of kind you know and those sensations or those gatherings then take on you know take 
start of the process, let's put it that way. And I've always felt and admired that if you could carry and sustain a practice like this for 30 years or 25 years, it means something. You know, even if one does not articulate it or has not artic articulated as yet, it means something. It has some energy. It has something to give. It brings you joy. It is exhilarating. It is painful, but it is a journey which is continuously happening. Like, let's say, a daily practice. Mm. You know, all of us. I mean, there's a daily practice involved. You know, whether we fail, whether we struggle, whether we are able to do something and get excited about it or not able to, the practice continues, and every day something gets gets onto it or gets added to it. Okay, yeah. and that is the way your practice has been evolving. And I'm going to go back a little in time to your work where you were actually exploring a lot of different materials. You have worked with threads, you have worked inside and out of surface, okay? Mm -hmm. You worked with, um, with uh, different kinds of graphites. Okay, the other day we were talking about how that is also part of a learning process when we were in college we were told the merits of a 4B and a 6B and a yeah. 2B and how much excitement that brought yeah. to us when on the paper we could see what, what tonalities and what textures a 6B could create and what something like an HB would do is, a, is very different and how those experiences build on, you know, that material becomes a part of your being, you know, as you work with it. And tell us something about this material exploration. When did your, when, why, or when you thought, <clears throat> because I think the material has a role to play, which is beyond it being just a tool or a medium. It takes on, uh, it takes on more, uh, its presence takes on much more, okay, for you, yeah. okay? So you should, I think there is somewhere a screen which is showing um, works where you have played with threads and ropes and things like that, okay? And you are also, uh, layering it with different material. So can you talk a little bit about a series of such works that you created, an assembly of such works, for instance, the rope work, for instance, or even the threads that go in and out of surfaces, or what was happening then, and what joy, or what did you get out of it? Um, I think story of material, sometimes mm. you have uh, things lying about in your uh, mm. studio. Uh, and my introduction to jute was uh, jute uh, rope was uh, uh, an installation I did in mm. Sanskriti Kendra in uh, 2001. Mm. Um, I made these earth mounds and, uh, mm. and under a champa grove there was an earth mound with uh, uh, bits of rope stuck into it. And the story, it was very strange, something, an accident I came across, that the ropes would flop. Mm. But the minute you watered it, these ropes would erect out, you know, really mm. almost like a, a mm. little mm. sexual, actually. In that. Mm. Um, and these ropes kind of stayed there for six months. The mound was then uh, dismounted and the ropes were lying in the studio for maybe another six years. Mm. And suddenly one day I started contorting it mm. and twining it with sutli. Mm. Now, I'm interested in the fact that it's a very simple, basic material mm -hmm. and to be able to do something out of nothing almost. Mm. So I think that's what actually excited me about Khoj Modinagar workshop, that you went there without any uh, of your studio uh, tools mm. or facilities mm. and you were trying to make something out of nothing. Mm. So that idea is really kind of deeply mm. honed in that sense that mm. I started contorting it and I started twining it and there was a tension and in which the forms were building. Uh, <clears throat> and it is, the material showed me the way. Mm. It's something you are not, I'm not fighting with the material, I'm mm. sort of going along with the material mm. and to see what can I make out of it. Mm. So that was an exciting uh, journey beginning mm. for the rope works which I made and <clears throat> However much the work which is acquired by KNMA, they are same length of rope, but you twine and twist it, they become mm. different forms each time. Mm. So even if you have like a measure to it, mm. but it's the material which is allowing you to become 
mm. different. Each one is unique. So I think that was an amazing kind mm. of truth one sort of comes across. And mm. uh, similarly, I think um, if I'm looking at watercolor or a water-based medium, mm. there's a fluidity which the medium offers you to float in and flow in. The same thing cannot happen with graphite or charcoal or compressed charcoal. So each one has a possibility, each one has a property, each one has an ability, which gets combined with what I can do. So there's a very nice relationship I have with material. I have with, um, so I think these are my pleasures in mm. making work. It's very simple and, uh, and, uh, and, I'm happy till the time it sustains itself mm. and then there is a need to switch and mm. find another material. Mm. And uh, so it sort of goes mm. on in that way and sometimes you chance upon something mm. which, which like um, we were living in a house where I designed the grill of the house mm. and uh, it was only drawing the same thing on the road and the welder would start following those mm. lines. This was 10 years back and I suddenly felt, let me push this further. Mm. And so these, this work with following you is working with a welder. I would make the drawing and the welder would hammer the uh, milestone, uh, mile steel rod and bend it in a way, weld it. Mm. We'll make two forms and then mm. we'll start joining the two forms. Mm. And then once that is ready, the work gets installed mm. and then the whole play of shadows start to mingle in and and the and the experience just i mean to me also it's a pleasure when mm. i uh, look at the work i mean the work goes through different stages of when you're making it in the studio and it's kind of lying about then it gets framed it gets documented then finally when it's up in the gallery that's when the real uh, mm. experience of what that work can speak comes up mm. And this then yet when I reinstall it in another <laughs> space, there's a dialogue with the, uh, with with space. the space. Mm. And I, I, I love that. Uh, I love that conversation with the space. And mm. I must say, I've learned it with Peter how to install. You know, we mm. are 24 years, we go back 24 years perhaps. <laughs> and before that, I've seen my father install his own exhibition. So I think I've seen that. And, mm. and I've tried to find a language of my own through mm. that. <coughs> Interesting you mentioned the watercolors because as, as I said yesterday when we were seeing this exhibition together that what comes through is that the, the spontaneity and the fluidity of the watercolors vis-a-vis -vis something like this, mm. solid, uh, specific, you know, cut in a particular way, handled in a particular way, you know, and uh, that is, is just like, its energy is very different, it's... Um, uh, what I like about it is that it's not any defined form, mm -hmm. okay, it's still uh, floating, mm -hmm. okay, it's still breathing, palpable, growing, something like that, layering it with, in many ways that you have done, I think all the dimensions of uh, nature that we don't see otherwise in one go, you know, there are observations and they've mm -hmm. piled up, you know, how they just get superimposed and then they come out when one is working and so one can see many things there, one can see an inner world, one can see a biological world, one can see cellular formations, one can see dispersion, mm. so much to see there and talk about in those works as they are moving in and out. When I come here, I see something different, you know. So the, the, the way that the juxtaposition, and there is a in-between which is there, sculptural forms, but again you have used, you know, um, lines and forms that are dispersing out of it or going, you know, spreading out very ethereally in space, you know. So there is this kind of a, a thing that I see in this, you know. And I, I, I want to first talk about this work because I feel that here two things to me that come to my mind is, one is you you are still keeping a frame in mind. Mm. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel that you are still working with a, with a frame, though it's, though it's open on the wall. It doesn't have a frame as such. Mm. But um, just a thought, like, why would a, why would a um, form like this not fall on the ground? Mm. 
okay <laughs> would why would it not mm. things like that come to my mind mm. so there is some kind of a formal language also at the same time that has evolved mm. which makes you think in a particular way or respond in a particular way mm. and what i found most interesting yesterday when we were speaking is how this work you know how the metal responded to what you were trying to do mm. okay so there is a metal sheet but what happens to metal with human touch mm. what happens to metal with human sweat what happens to metal when it is beaten when it is hammered okay and how what happened to it did it on its own take this kind of a sensual turn what really happened what were the uh, what were the kind of instructions or learnings as you uh, translated whatever you wanted to do in a in a solid um, material like metal mm. so tell us something about that because that's very interesting what uh, um i think i'm still a wall based artist mm. you mm. know i've still i'm growing out of it slowly mm -hmm. i have not become independent of the wall mm -hmm. uh and so it does get connected with the mm -hmm. wall and mm -hmm. it projects out and as peter was saying that these are wall reliefs which is mm -hmm. true mm -hmm. they are extension projections out of the wall um <clears throat> the metal i did a commission work uh, for rajiv sethi and um, i should thank him to introduce me to something like a metal mm. uh the work was then made in uh, copper iron and bronze and brass sorry uh out of that the color of copper and iron just mm. completely excited me mm. because there's a beautiful so transformation mm. which happens mm. as soon as you touch it or hammer it uh there's uh, human sweat uh also uh the hammering it contorts the metal and mm. the shapes actually are formed by hammering i let that happen we were not correcting it mm. so this is this turning and yeah. contorting has happened because one it is hammered from one side some of them get hammered from the other side so the conduct so it's material again which is making me understand and leading me on mm. so I, i i i like that fact that the material is leading me on mm. it is showing me the way and i'm mm. allowing that space mm. um also these two metals are very much prevalent in our kitchen ware so you have mm. copper vessels and iron vessels and mm. uh, so our history and association is immense with this mm -hmm. metal mm -hmm. uh each home has a story in that sense so i think all this was probably playing on in my mind and the hammering on these patilas and uh, mm. was a beginning of what can one do with different kind of bits to hammer and perforate but i think the main energy is just the way the oxidization and patina starts on the metal the minute there is a human touch mm. so i think one thing very very uh, prevalent in the body of work is e the presence of hand mm. whether it, it's my own hand yeah. making the work or the hand of the welder or the hammersmith mm. there is it's all about very basic tools which mm. are making the work and i have great faith in that uh, it's the faith of human mm. hands um sometimes my two hands are not enough to make a work so i borrow others hands mm -hmm. and and mm -hmm. and and m work scale with up it. work with it but mm -hmm. there is there is this um, immense trust in the power of hands and what our hands can do mm -hmm. <coughs> so this may take you to a to a welder or to a workshop maybe yeah. Yeah. and something like your watercolors may take you in your studio space in your solitude mm. in some other kind of a, you know mental yeah. makeup and what i feel also about the watercolors and i want you to talk about it i'm just going to <laughs> throw a question you talked about this to me that it's very interesting the choice of paper and then how you were giving baths to the paper yeah okay and i think the residue is extremely important mm. in your work you know what is that residue and what does it do to sensitize you know uh, layers you when you give a bath some remnant or some trace remains mm. then you work on it you again give a bath mm. to it and it goes on and somewhere this from the solidity to something so 
something transparent, something porous, mm. something airy, something that contains a space mm. within a space mm. kind of feeling comes in these in in the way that these watercolors are working. Mm. When you go in the other room, especially behind those four works that have different very powerful colors, mm. but at the end I'm not just looking at the colors. I'm not looking at the most striking part of it. Mm. It is drawing me inside to many little things that are happening there, the little things that have remained, the residues that mm. have now been layered, you know. And so that uh, that part to me is very interesting because in a way it is an unsettling image. Mm. It has not settled, it has not defined itself, mm. it has not taken its final shape perhaps, I don't know. You mm. may stop somewhere mm. like Ashok Ahuja writes that mm. you know exactly where to stop. There are artists like Sheila who may not know where to stop or worse even Jayashri Chakravati always cries. After doing a 40, 40 feet scroll she says, Main kahan band karu? Mujhe pata hi kahan band karu? So there, there, is a, there is a thing that she always expresses, I don't know where to stop. Mm. So she will add more and the 40 feet scroll will become a 60 feet scroll and then 40 feet is rolled and 10 feet is out to work or 20 feet is out. But just imagine, it's very interesting since this is, since this is like between sense and being, there is this um, process, mm. okay, of working. And um, you still know perhaps that this work, maybe you know where mm. to stop or where to end it or where to say, yeah. now from here onwards I want to d be away from it or whatever. So let's go back to your work, those watercolors. You do you want to add something to it? Because I find you should, yeah, I don't know how you articulate them or whether you do or not. But for me, this idea that of uh, residual layering and working with what you said, the, even the, uh, the, uh, the material goes through a lot. Mm. Metal is hammered, mm. okay? Uh, what paper is washed again and again? It is cleansed and cleansed and cleansed, and the residue is formed. For, mm. It's very interesting. So there is this. So it's not. It's a process internally within you mm. what you're doing, but there is also something that externalizes, you know, and the process takes on on the material a bearing of some kind, you know. And let's talk a little bit about this because I I find it I find that juxtaposition amazing. That um, here is a very fluid floating undefined, amorphous life, energy, form, mm. okay, which, and here is something definite, cut, mm. molded, whatever, you know, beaten, hammered, mm. uh, drilled, I don't know, the holes are drilled and many other things which, you know. I think I do move into extremes. Mm. Uh, so there was a phase, the work mm. was monochromatic and mm. then there's a complete wild desire to pour out colors mm. and pigments. So I think this oscillation between mm. two extremes has been a kind of a, a exciting process for me. Um, the five works, I call them fairies, I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, so titles are a big challenge, which yeah. big difficulty. Uh, so Fairies, I don't think they should be called fairies, but that was the best I could do. Mm. That, to me, the edge is very important of mm -hmm. the paper mm. and how I contain the image. So, whereas these works are centralized uh, images, I thought, let me break out of the edge. Mm. And so, in doing so, I think it was not a very satisfying journey and I wasn't very happy with it. So each time I did something, I would just wash it under the tap and literally with a brush kind of scrub the layers off. But what left behind was this beautiful phantom images of past and uh, past haunts you and past haunts you in life and in the process of making the work too. Mm -hmm. It has a memory which is etched sometimes deeply, sometimes faint uh, mm. edge, but it's present. And I want to acknowledge that. And I think this becomes part of making. And 
in the journey of making on and on somewhere you start to hold because in life you can't just be floating and flowing mm -hmm. you got to grab it you anchor somewhere. you anchor it somewhere so you have i mean i need to start holding the image in some way mm -hmm. and from those phantom images and unclear blurs certain kind of specificness starts to come and an area can lead me to be more specific into the other area and then mm. this whole play of how much how less and the proportion practice of it's like it's like um, it's like i like to work in a constrained structure and see how much i can push myself in it mm. so so these are the parameters i set for mm. myself and then i see how much i can fly and uh, and this is almost the story or the process of making which mm. unravels itself as i'm doing i don't have to tell this story to any everybody when I'm, i mean image is there the work mm. is there but this is what which goes into now from a very floating uh, fluid world you also need to anchor it back to something solid mm. and 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 robust mm. therefore these kind of things mm. also happen and uh, and yeah. and that thing happens so i think it's it's nice for me to oscillate between things and 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 that's what creates a world for me and and that's the world i meander in and it's a bit like mm. i don't know musical compositions you mm. you i mean a rag has a structure few notes mm. and it's amazing when you hear bhimsen joshi meander mm. and that kind of rigor and skill which mm. which a maestro can have is 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 it opens out another world for the listener also mm. and as is fantastic if mm. one can go there i'm not comparing that with mm. my process i'm mm. nowhere in that mm. sense but this is the kind of world which begins to um, mm. churn out <laughs> yeah i don't I'm, know if i've answered you, the question no, no, i'm glad you talked about phantom images and how they haunt because here is also the presence of a shadow yep in the work you know and it takes me back again to nasreen in some very strange mm -hmm. way um i'm not going to talk about her work uh, i'm just going to uh, remember one of the exercises i don't know whether she did that with you but with us as students because she always wanted us to be outdoors mm -hmm. rather than be in studio spaces we'll be sitting out and she would just say that choose where you want to sit okay and um and just draw what you want to draw mm -hmm. okay and but the 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 only instruction was that after two and a half or three hours you will stop mm. Mm? and i realized it much later that that shadow has so much to do with time yeah and so does form you know yeah. it has time is so critical yeah. to this understanding and this awareness mm. and that is what used to happen so if i suppose chosen in in the faculty of finance a tree that i loved or liked every day i used to go and sit there and make that tree and by the time that she said it's lunch time or something i would see that my shadows have changed mm. okay and it was a realization that don't she never told us why mm. but the exercise was a way of creating an awareness mm. to certain things mm. okay and so some teachers take you beyond curriculums and beyond the uh, rigidity of curriculum so to say to say that what is the sensitization process okay what does it do to an to a student for instance if it's if a teacher tells you the first day don't um, draw pick up an object or anything that you find lying on the ground and and draw it i would i picked up a stone the first day and the stone had uh, tar in between so it had two shades there had a stone outside and the tar inside i picked up a stone like that somebody picked up some stick somebody a twig somebody some mirror half broken some, and we were wondering because we have come with this notion and especially if you have given some government exams intermediary <laughs> and all that shadow or shade of pencil and object drawing and all that which i did you know i came with that understanding that i have to show that with a pencil i can yeah. you know create proportions and measure and get she completely disrupted yeah. and unsettled us by saying something like this you know so we choose our own objects and then we have to own them in one sense because we have to draw them and sometimes she'll be very excited and twitch her mouth and 
we would um, understand that she's appreciating something mm. about it. What she's appreciating is something, maybe a texture of it, weight of it. I don't know what she was appreciating. Mm. We never asked questions in that form. She would say something, of course, a little bit. But this process of sensitization, of mindfulness, of a sense yeah. of awareness of time and transformation, both, mm. okay, that things are not always there, okay? So you, you, and I think photographers would know it much more mm. because it is always the moment. It's okay? the light. Yeah, and that moment which mm. is, which can just in a second slip mm. by, you know, we, the moment you sit and think, it's gone. Mm. That kind of uh, um, awareness sometimes leads to seeing things that otherwise we are not tuned to see in our environment, in our daily places, mm. in our everyday objects, all of those. Mm. There could be some reflections also of those, you know, things lying on your table, things. You, we re really don't know what, what triggers something in us, mm. you know, what is that form, you know. That is why some greatest poets could write, Morandi could write a poem yeah. on still objects, you know, on kettles and yeah. pans and, <laughs> can you imagine Bottles. how, is, but just, and Himma taught me about that, mm. about Morandi, how he rates him as the, one, of the, <clears throat> one of the geniuses, because what he did to still life, nobody could do it. Yeah. He made the still life become alive. Yeah, and small he, paintings. You know, and small works, and they, they take on a metaphysical yeah. connotation, totally. they take on a spiritual dimension, and it's just a kettle which every day you mm. make coffee or tea in. <coughs> so I feel in your work, <coughs> sorry, my throat is not good. In your work, I see this, and I'm bringing this again and again because <coughs> you may be asked several times, and perhaps this is the most irritating part that an artist needs, faces. What is this? Yeah. <laughs> what, what is that? Hmm? What is your work hai? about? <laughs> what is your work about? And I don't blame anybody. This, this is natural. It's a valid question. There is a curiosity, okay? They, you want to reach, you want to become one with the artist in some way, okay? If not fully, in some way want to understand so that something gets transacted in the way that you have been seeing the world. Mm. It a little will brush on us also that we will understand this. More than that, wh how do we really talk about any work as such? You know, the explanations are always um, never incomplete, never complete, never perfect. You know, of any work, not just this work, any work for that matter. There is no one definite way. There is no one definite mm -hmm. answer or a perfect explanation that one can give. So it leaves. So, so for me, this mindfulness or this awareness or this awakening to moments, the, the gathering of such experiences from really uh, routine and therefore I don't, I don't feel um, any um, regrets, nahi, but what is the term? When people say that replication hai, repetition hai, um, you know, because these are all elements of rhythms of life. These are all elements of rhythms of nature, okay? It is part of part and parcel mm. of life. These are elements. What is otherwise meditation? Mm. Okay, how do we? I'm not even using that kind of a heavy mm. term. I'm not coming to it directly. I'm just saying there are these things. You have to work with repetition. Mm. You have to work with patience. You have to persevere. You have to do things again and again. You know, and that daily practice or that rigor or whatever you call it. It, it is the only way that you refine, not just your hand or skill, it is a refinement of one's whole being, you know, along with it. So for me, I'm looking at this work not from any such lens that visually or what, what you have gathered in your, in your observations and only through your visual knowledge. I'm taking it beyond, I'm opening it up for you in that sense to say, to speak about it whatever you want to share with us, if you have any such unique experience or you want to say that, no, this is my life. Your mother made images, uh, figures all her life. She's mm. still drawing and painting figures. Mm. You have been close to that kind of a discipline also. Yes. Okay. 
your father has used colors and he's worked with many mysterious forms, both biological, both bio biomorphic, biomorphic or even otherwise. So there are energies, but what you are evolving in your language, you know, where is it going? Do you feel that this practice is, it, it has in these many years, you know, it has taken you, it has given you some direction or a lead on that you know at, at this point of time that I don't want to do certain things. At least there is that kind of, I think there is a kind of a sense that gets built up that I know that I will, I'm responding to music or I'm responding to this or I respond to this and I certainly can, I'm not drawn to these, these things and there is that process of mm. leaving behind something that you don't want to take along. We almost learn that mm. we can't take everything and go ahead all the time. We have to leave behind certain things. Mm. You can speak whatever. You don't have to respond to what I said. You can counter it or you can give lot. your own view and then we can open it up to... Uh, uh, there was a lot. Uh, one little confession when I saw Melly's body of work, Melly Gobai, mm -hmm. and his early figurative studies, they are staggeringly astounding. And so when I see things like this, I feel, why can't I go back to school again and draw? That urge comes uh, sometimes that, why don't I draw from life again? And, uh, but it's all about that whole exchange and pleasure of uh, subject and uh, certain kind of give and take, just like the relationship with the material is. So it is about certain kind of communication and give and take. Nasreen's presence in my life has been enormous in the way that she sensitized me in certain way that other things didn't do it at that time and I didn't even realize it was impacting me. I would go to her house and she would say, look at that shaft of light from the window. Or a shadow. Or a shadow. And I was like, kya Nasreen kuch samaj mein nahi aara hai, kya bol rahe ho? And, but, I mean, it, it is these things which kind of stays with you. The one question she posed to us was when we were doing object drawing is to decide whether you want to have the paper vertical or horizontal. And it became a major decision as to how the composition is going to be laid out on the paper. So I'm again very um, obsessed about the verticality of the work and the horizontalness of the work what if it is rectangle? What if it is square? For me, all these small things become quite a decision. Um, <clears throat> and I think she was someone who heard music all the time. All the time. You go to her house, there would be Bhimsen and Joshi playing, or the cries of the whales underwater. Or I, it, that house would be filled with sound. And uh, so I don't know, there was a volume of sound in her house, which, which I don't know, must have impacted me in some ways. Um, <clears throat> so I don't know, these are these different stations of one's life, one encounters people like that, and it leaves an impression. Another thing I think which is important for me is labor, labor of making something. Um, and I also come from a family which is completely do-it-yourself kind of family. Uh, both my parents are uh, work hard, they spend hours in the studio. I have my sister laboriously does embroidery, crochet, uh, uh, stitching herself. She's such a perfectionist that no tailors can work with her. So there is that kind of a, you set a bar on in your work. So it comes, I live with a man who is completely a do-it-yourself person. Ashok does things himself, come what may. You know, if, even when he was shooting film, he would be behind the camera and he's written his script. He is um, completely a person, hands-on person with everything he does. So I think that everything rubs on to you, your own life, your companionship, your heritage which comes from uh, your parents, your uh, sibling, your... Uh, so 
it's all put together. This is the masala I am made of. And uh, I have to now fry it into something. So, so I have nothing else to say. I really don't have much to say, actually. Um, if my work can be experienced, yes. well and good. If not, that is also fine, That's you know. True. I don't have a story, find a story for yourself. And it's fine, it's a relationship building measure. It's a communication mm -hmm. of certain pleasures which is there in making and you mm -hmm. share it. Mm -hmm. I really don't have much to no, say. Wonderful. I think you remember when we started the conversation over the phone, we were, the questions that are normally asked is what is abstraction, define mm. abstraction. I think one would do real injustice if one starts defining abstraction because each one has its own language, own journey and the mystery is very important that it contains. I, I think that if you just completely take away that, you know, just for the sake of defining something, you know, and slotting it. Uh, so I think that um, it's good to be liberated from that, that one is not really getting into this kind of a conversation where what is abstraction, how much, and how is it done, and why, what does it mean to you? And I think some things, when they remain mysterious, they hold much more. It's like those perforations which you peep into, no? You, you are constantly in your work, there are these points of unveiling and points of peeping into something else, you know. <laughs> yeah. You're not going into them. And so I think um, we'll stop here because of this. we can keep talking. Thank you so much, Manisha. This is really amazing, yeah. wonderful. And I, I, I think Thank you. Um, Perhaps there's anyone has any questions or comments they'd like to? Yeah, good, good. Manisha good. here in the front row. <laughs> um, uh, Manisha, your process of assimilation of material yeah. for, say, you talked about the ropes which you found in Sanskrit and they entered your work, but you've used wicks, you've used, as in cotton wick, mm. you've used leather, okay. those yeah. bags. Mm. One of the shows you had, there were bean bags when yeah, they led. Yeah. So, <laughs> no. What I what I want to ask is, um, do you go seeking your material, or does it enter your practice when you go to the market and you find something, and you say this could this could be a work I'll make? It's uh, it's both. Uh, sometimes. I am in a complete vacuum and I don't know what to do with myself and so there was a situation when I said, okay, let me start with basics and I started doing graphite drawings because that's how you start in college. Uh, sometimes you just encounter things uh, uh, in the market in, uh, with your also fellow creative beings working with certain kind of material and you feel like, oh, let me just go back uh, to the studio and do something. But it's, it's raw thought. You have to then sit and let it ferment and marinate into something which can become a dish of your own. I mean, it's, it's, it needs that process of, uh, of uh, maturing a wine and you have to give it time. Uh, so, these are chance encounters, meeting people, um, artworks. I'm a sucker of moving image. I watch a lot of cinema and uh, everything is there, but it takes a while to make it your own. And so um, our wonderful designer friends, what they make with material, I think it's extraordinary. But, uh, and then that gives you a thought and idea to begin. But, it's all there, but it takes a while to become one's own. Yes, but I do think part of the strength of, the, of, of your work now, Manisha, having worked with you for 24 years, is the, is the rigor of the, of the choices that you make. I mean, yeah, we're all, we're all swimming in a sea of influences and possibilities, and some people are, a lot of artists are completely overwhelmed by that and bob around losing track and losing themselves and you've been incredibly consistent in taking many different things and honing them into your own language which is still you know which is is remained incredibly consistent i mean we're here with 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 
paintings on paper that, that you know, have continued as a, as a solid stream since the first time we worked together in 98. But now we have these, also these other um, sort of um, detours into other things. And what I love about this show is, is the similarities and the differences. These two metal wall reliefs on either side of the gallery are like just amazing. They're, they're very similar in the program, but also completely different things. And to me, that's kind of astounding the way you've, you've done that, you know. Thank you. <laughs> and also the configurations when they change. Yeah. They take on some other life. <laughs> Yeah, the change and the continuity at the same time. Yeah, yeah. and that's continuity. That's the simultaneous, that, that's the sort of amazing thing. But what I like in the practice is this continuity. Because you go to the Japan Foundation work, you see yeah, these... I, I wanted that here, but we didn't have room for it. Yeah. It's all, it happens yeah, to be on the screen there. right yeah, now. That now. One, yeah. now that's made with fabric which, and balsa wood, right? Which I really worked. It's wood, no? Yeah, it's wood. wood yeah. Oh, I thought there's fabric in it also, no? Yeah, there is, but there are these there little uh, fabric silk, um, yeah, things. There's silk in it and the wood. Ah, so whatever the insects was, ate away. It was shown here at the at the Japan Institute, and then and then Javeri Contemporary showed it very, in very in Bombay. I never got to show it. I really wanted it to be in the show, but we did. I mean, we didn't have any room. <laughs> <laughs> no, but